One of the studies we reference in the book is that as people move away from organized religion, their movement modalities have the same sort of tribalism and fervor that people once used to put into their religion, which is just interesting. And you see it play out in Pilates and CrossFit and all the different modalities that we do today. But we really approach the book as like, it's longevity for the rest of us. We can't keep up with these protocols. And it's literally our job <laughs> to be at the forefront of health and well-being. And as two parents and entrepreneurs, but everyone's busy and everyone has commitments kind of regardless of what life stage we're like we can't even do this and we have such a conflicted relationship with the word wellness because we've seen literally the life-saving role it can play in our own lives but we also you know appreciate the criticisms especially as they're rolled out on social media so we really approached it from what is going to have the biggest ROI on your own health and well-being and how do you figure that out and then integrate it being the key word into your life so that it's not something extra that you have to do Thank you to Mello for sponsoring this episode of the show. Mello is made by a company called Ned, and they make a super blend chai latte, aminos, functional mushrooms, magnesium, cinnamon, clove, ginger. I used to drink it hot in the winter, and now I've been drinking it cold. What I do is I engage my daughter. We mix it. We throw it in the fridge till bedtime. I drink it an hour before bed. Helps me sleep. It has chaga, rishi, ashwagandha, all of these herbs that have been around for a long time. And I think you're going to make a huge comeback because of their safety and efficacy. These are all crafted with single origin ingredients. They're ethically sourced from small scale farms. Another reason why I love it. It doesn't have any melatonin or dairy, CBD, caffeine, nothing. It is third party tested, which is amazing. It has what it says it has in it. I'm telling you, if you are having trouble sleeping, try their Shuddai Chai. You can head on over to Hello Ned. That's H E L L O N E D dot com slash Dr. Lion, and you will get a 15% off your order. Hello Ned dot com slash Dr. Lion, and you will get 15% off your order. Before it was actually even a space of health and wellness, you were the founders of Mind Body Green, which, by the way, I think kind of turned me down when I went there about six years ago. Not that I'm holding it against you all, but that potentially did happen. I'll just throw that out there. <laughs> I'm still going to find out what happened. <laughs> we'll get um, to the bottom of yeah, that. Yeah, you, yeah, you better. Um, you are leaders in this space and both entrepreneurial right? This was not a health and wellness as your first line, but rather because you saw a need and a need within yourself. If you can just mention and, and talk a little bit about how it started. So the, 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 the backstory, backstory is my lower back. And <laughs> no pun intended. Yes, no pun intended. As you mentioned, I'm very tall. I'm six foot seven. I played basketball in college. And fast forward, you know, I Graduated from Columbia in 98, fast forward to 2007 and 8, I'm part of a startup, it's not doing well, and I am flying way too much, 100,000 miles plus domestic. Me in a coach seat is not a good look for anyone. But definitely not for you. Terrible. <laughs> so old basketball injury combined with stress, uh, poor diet. My idea of a great diet box back then was just steak and martinis at the Palm Steakhouse in Midtown Manhattan. If you go up to 15 and 8th, you'll see a picture of me on the wall next to Adam Sandler and Joe Namath. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> They're like, this guy is here. He has his own table. Probably more martinis and steak. Uh, so with all that said, it led to two extruded discs, discs to my lower back, L4, L5, S1. I had excruciating sciatica. I could not walk. Went to a doctor. He said, you need surgery. Nothing against surgery, but see it generally as a last resort. So I sought a second opinion. That doctor said the same thing. And almost like an after, afterthought, he said, you know, maybe some yoga could help. So started some really light yoga over the course of three to six months that the sciatica went away i completely healed and i had this moment where i said you know true well-being is not about you know keep in mind we're going back in time like the well-being wasn't even a word wellness was spa life everything was about like you know abs and six packs nothing against them but there's more to the picture but in my mind it was this blend of mental physical spiritual emotional and environmental well-being all connected hence mind buddy green one word not three and that was kind of the birth of Mind Buddy Green, it started with content, then we went to classes and then products with supplements, events, um, and podcasts now. Uh, and I'd say 
where we sit today, my passion has evolved to longevity. Um, I'm 48, we have two little girls. Men in my family have a terrible track record with longevity. Father died of heart disease at 47, maternal grandfather, heart disease at 49, paternal grandfather, cancer at 44. Ugh. And so, but I'm not buying into that. I believe in the power of epigenetics, that stops with me. And so I am determined to live not just a long life, you know, I think there's a conversation around longevity right now, which is great. Longevity we view as kind of like the 1.0 and then there's health span because living long doesn't necessarily mean you're healthy. No one wants to live till 90 and be in a wheelchair for the last 25 years. So the conversations evolved the health span where I am healthy, I'm able, I can do the things I want to do for as long as I can. And then I, li I have a very fast death. <laughs> We like the conversation about we're coining joy span because what's the why behind all of this? You want to live a very long, healthy life, but be joyful and enjoy it because you could be fit and doing all the things you want to do. But if your children don't talk to you and you have no friends, that's not going to be fun either. So I'll pause there. <laughs> And I also had a personal experience that really brought me into this world of health and wellness. Um, back in the 2010s in New York, I was coming from a yoga class because that was what you did in the 2010s in New York and was like, Jason, I'm having some some trouble breathing. You know, uh, can you meet me in the city? We were walking around and I was like, I think I need to go home. We took the A train home and I like collapsed on the stairs trying to get up from the subway. And as was my tendency, I, I gaslit myself and was like, I'm fine. I don't need to go to a doctor right now. I, I napped and did these things that I don't do over the weekend. And then on Monday morning, Jason was like, you're not going to work unless you go to the doctor. I went to my doctor in Soho and he's like, you're having a pulmonary embolism. And I was so confused. What is happening? I was... <laughs> He gave me a piece of paper and he wrote, I'm having a pulmonary embolism because he didn't think that if I was left at NYU that I would be able to communicate what was going on and get the care I needed. That's really serious. It was really serious. Once I got there, they were like, we've never seen someone with so many showers of clots in their lungs that's still, al uh, still alive. And... Um, you know, the likely culprit of it was me being on birth control pills, which I had been on for a decade. And, you know, when you do the standard kind of panel testing that you would do at an OBGYN, I don't have any of the predispositions for major clotting. So I'm not like a big red alert kind of candidate, but it was definitely one of those, you know, gut-wrenching moments of the soul. I often don't think you make really big changes in your life and evaluate kind of your own life's mission and purpose and and what you're doing here on this wonderful planet until you reach one of those low pay points when everything's fine. You're like, okay, I'll keep on doing what I'm doing. So that was a start for me of a very long recovery. And a pulmonary embolism is one of those, you know, invisible illnesses because it was the first time that I'm like, I am having trouble breathing. Um, I would fight old ladies on the subway for that chair so that I could sit down because I didn't think I could stand the whole time. And I, you know, really looked to, you know, women like Serena Williams who had had pulmonary embolisms and people who had overcome these types of um, issues to, to remind myself I'm going to be okay again. I'm going to be able to breathe and run and exercise and and do all these things. And it was a start of a journey on both the Western side, the spiritual side, the movement side of really just looking of what would, you know, help me create a complete and fulfilling life. And I tried a lot of things. Some of them worked, some of them didn't. And I hope that this book can help people kind of get to the answer faster, because I think it's a lot in, in the fundamentals. That's really altruistic and so important. Now, where was it in terms of how far along was mine body green? When Colleen almost yep. died? 2012. <laughs> so it was, it was May 2012. Yeah, that would have been really bad for business. <laughs> yeah. So so I was still working a corporate job yeah. at that point in time. You know, Jason always jokes that I, I just missed Exxon on my tour of duty because I had been working at Gap, Walmart, and Amazon. And that was kind of the catalyst to to move in full time and yeah. and you already had ha you had mind body green already. Yeah. So it's it, it officially launched in 2009 and I initially said to Colleen like give me 6 months I'll figure out how we can monetize this. 6 months turned into almost 3 years. We had a really and good so, therapist in the early days. <laughs> we had a very days. good that therapist. Is, it was stressful. Yeah. We had just gotten married yeah. and it was really stressful and you know Colleen was supporting us and paying our health insurance and that you know it, it <laughs> there was a lot of passion that 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 
that allowed me to go on because it was it was terrible on our marriage. Yeah. But eventually it did all work out. And, you know, I think it, it, Colleen also like would work on weekends and write. I would, you know, this is how we have to go back in time here. I remember I would I would do every well, I didn't code. My co-founders were <clears throat> could could code. That was one thing I couldn't do. When I would post on social media, I had to stay there. You couldn't like auto populate things on Facebook. And when they al allowed you to actually populate, I'm like, oh my God, I can leave. <laughs> Unbelievable. I can leave. I can schedule posts. <laughs> yes. No Instagram back then. Okay. You were you were working and supporting the family. You were working on a dream yep. and you were very focused. You'd, you're obviously an athlete. You'd been an athlete and you were heads down. This is the way it was going to be and you were going to make it work. Yes. And the first couple of years, I'm like, you'd get a little momentum. But in 2012, that's when things started to really started to take off where I think I have to go through the numbers. It's been a while. But you know, from zero to 100,000 unique monthly visitors took almost, I think that was to like sometime in late 2011, I want to say in January 2012, then we went to 500 and then 500 went to a million and then 15 million. Couple Not too shabby. A couple years mm -hmm. later. Not too but, shabby. But like the first three years was zero to 100 and then the J curve. And then there were some bumps the along the way. <laughs> the first three years, you had a very good therapist and you had a, a sugar mama. And, and yes. ultimately, I think, you know, the lessons that we learned in therapy were so applicable to business of this idea of financial well-being, that if we were going to live together as partners and then work together as partners, like we had to have a similar understanding of how we all, you know, viewed money and kind of bring it closer together, understand our risk thresholds, understand, you know, tolerances. And it's been, you know, helpful for our marriage of of course, but also for our business. Yeah. And that's financial literacy also leads to, you know, health and wealth. It's, it's you know, they're together. You wrote a book on the topic. Yeah, that was my first book. This book's way better. <laughs> <laughs> way better. But... Well, it is. I mean, I am in the book here. I saw my name. I'm officially published in this You've book. You've had a profound <laughs> influence on us. But I, I think too, you know, I would say Colleen felt like she got dragged onto the entrepreneurial journey where I was like, I'm going to figure this out. And then it's like, wait, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> but I think ultimately it made us stronger as a couple. I think it, it made us stronger as entrepreneurs. And I think, you know, getting, getting an understanding of, you know, our, our thresholds for risks and how we communicated and how actually we thought about running a business ultimately made us better co-founders and co-CEOs. We actually work quite well together. And we've seen a lot of people in the space when the husband and wife starts to work together, it completely falls apart and destroys the marriage. We've, yeah. we've seen that. But for us, we actually like complement each other very well and know our strengths and weaknesses and know when to get out of the way of each other. I'm really curious. That was a lot of foresight to think about. Were, did you create something for yourself because it didn't exist at the time? Yeah. Yeah. You I mean, back then there was print magazine. It was all the print magazines, you know, shape, self, women's health. Muscle and fitness. Muscle and fitness. The only thing that was holistic, you know, it's funny because I think we've gone back to this place. You had like, I would say traditional mainstream fitness, I would say more Western than anything that was slightly holistic was way out there. So Mercola was around, Elephant Journal, that I've heard, talked about that name in a while. But it, in my mind, you know, there was an opportunity to, to be somewhat integrative and balanced and not just preach to a, a choir of people who live in the west side of LA or Brooklyn and Boulder, and that there was an opportunity to cross over and, and both worlds could exist. And then I look back at where, and I thought we were making progress and I look at where, we're, where we are today and I'm like, we've gone completely backwards. Why? Why have we gone backwards? I think we live in a world of polarization. I think what you see, you know, there are, there are a couple of things. I think it's playing out in the political landscape and, and it's also driven by social media. And so there's a great statistic in the book where researchers at Wharton analyze the most viral articles of the New York Times, the most emailed list, and they classify the articles by emotion. And so the top three were awe, anxiety, and anger. Anger was number one. Anger increased virality by 34%. So if you just like pause and digest, so what does that mean? So if you write an article that, that, that causes someone or a large group of people to be angry, that article is going to be read more, is going to be shared more. It is going to, you know, 
more clicks equals more revenue equals more subscriptions equals more engagement. And so if you think about media and media, even if you're, if you, that could be a personality, a brand, a personal brand, or a publication as big as the New York Times, you're incentivized to have strong points of view that <clears throat> tend to alienate some people. And so that's why I think we're there. And I think without going down the rabbit hole of COVID, that played a significant role. Uh, so unfortunately, I think we're back at that place where, you know, there, you know, I think there's a good lot. There are some people who are exclusively, you know, will will take supplements and will never take a pharmaceutical drug. And there's, and they're the same goes for people who take pharmaceuticals and never take a supplement. And then there's, then I, I say there's balance of someone, depending on the circumstance is open to any type of intervention, but that really doesn't exist. <laughs> That's crazy. Essentially, we could make a post that would make people very angry, which we have. I mean, we could just share our interview and then it's going to go viral. So let's talk about Pilates. <laughs> It is it is so it is so amazing that the space that we're living in and this is the the foundation for where people are getting information. People are getting information on the internet, on social media. It doesn't necessarily mean that the information is good information and the culture is now so divisive rather than if the ultimate goal is how do we move the needle, which I think you guys really did a great job with the book and I I want to understand why you chose the pillars that you chose, especially as you talk about leading a joyful, what did you call it? Um, joy span? Joy span. I love that word, joy span. Um, you know, as we think about how do we come together as a team, if we thought about the entire society as a team, how do we move the needle? And right now, I love what you're saying is that we're back at square run. We're, we are fighting about the things that are so minuscule or on the periphery of does this really matter? And are you doing Pilates? <laughs> I'm not doing any. But well, that, that's a good example. When I, you know, I'll bring it up. When, when I had you on our show, you know, I asked about Pilates and was that enough, you know, to to, to build lean muscle mass? And you said no, it really isn't. And you love Pilates. There's a lot of great, a lot of great stuff that Pilates can do for someone. But if if your primary if your primary goal is to build lean muscle mass, it's probably not the most effective use of your time. If you do Pilates, you should still do it. And that created an uproar. And it's kind of ridiculous because- it's comical, quite comical. It, it, it really is. And I think what, specifically, if we're gonna go to like the inside baseball of health and wellness, you know, we could get in a diet. That's like the, the worst one. There are lots of landmines in diet. And I, apparently in Pilates too, in fitness, I think, you know, there's so much we all agree on. And at the highest level, you know, if you think about <laughs> the obesity crisis, the diabetes, like there's so many, it, 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 over 90% of us now, it used to be 88% are metabolically unhealthy. And so we're not really doing a good job of, of building a bigger uh, church here and letting people in, we're failing. And if I'm an outsider who who's trying to get well and I'm looking in our space, I'm like, these people are a mess. Yeah. yeah train wrecks yeah. like the, the, they can't the agree on bananas that, right yeah. the conversation <laughs> or pilates so, or pilates it is yes the conversations you know are train wreck conversations and people are fighting with each other and doing things that definitely don't move the needle and confuse the general population how have you solved that well i think it's you know, one of the studies we reference in the book is that as people move away from um, organized religion, their movement modalities have the same sort of tribalism and fervor that people once used to put into their uh, religion, which is just interesting. And you see it play out in Pilates and CrossFit and all the different modalities that we do today. But we really approached the book as like, it's longevity for the rest of us. We can't keep up with these protocols. And it's literally our job <laughs> to be at the forefront of health and well-being. And as two parents and entrepreneurs, but everyone's busy and everyone has commitments kind of regardless of what life stage, we're like, we can't even do this. And we have such a conflicted relationship with the word wellness because we've seen literally the life-saving role it can play in our own lives. But we also you know, appreciate the criticisms, especially as they're rolled out on social media. So we really approached 
approached it from what is going to have the biggest ROI on your own health and well-being and how do you figure that out and then integrate it being the key word into your life so that it's not something extra that you have to do. And look, I, I understand so many people come to this world from there's a, a healing that takes place. Maybe it's an illness that no one can figure out and they remove something from their diet and all of a sudden it goes away. Or they had, you know, in my instance, my back issues, yoga saved me from back surgery. When that happened, I couldn't get enough yoga. <laughs> I went to like every public yoga class in New York City. You know, I used to go to Tara Stiles class all the time. I go to Elena Brower. I go to Jiva <laughs> Mukti. I would go whoever was in town. We go to LA. We go whoever, Sean Korn, like it, all the great yoga. And I couldn't get enough of it. And then, well, obviously the business grew and that started to like, I don't have time for yoga. Um, and, you know, I think what happened over the long term is I ignored resistance training. And then I had a moment, which I talk about in the book, where all of a sudden I had lost weight and I'm like, I don't understand where it went. I started doing some training, but I, I stopped doing legs. I never liked doing legs. I stopped doing legs like 25 years ago, like the last time I played basketball. I'm like, I'm done with legs. And then I looked in the mirror. I'm like, my ass is gone. I've, I've lost, not, not like, I don't care about the aesthetics here, but like, oh my God, I'm getting all white man ass. Like I need to go back in the gym and do legs and resistance training. It was like an eye-opening moment. I had talked talk to you recently. And so like, this is like a way of saying is I understand how, something saves them, it becomes part of their identity. And if you challenge that point of view, whether it be yoga, Pilates, a certain diet, someone feels attacked personally. And I think it's difficult to sometimes step back and say, wow, like, am I doing the right thing? Am I ignoring something? I, you know, is my ass shrinking too? <laughs> or am I not as well as I could be? And I think that's difficult to do. And I think one of the reasons we're able to do it is because it's kind of our job you have a huge responsibility with that. Uh, be about like we yeah. believe it's our job to be balanced and have mul we actually believe in multiple points of view. Yeah, you have a huge responsibility because of the size of the platform and also being one of the first ones. People look to you. People look to Mind Body Green and they want to find well vetted information. And I know that you are very, very interested in that integration of well-vetted scientific, scientific information with the art of medicine and the art of healing. Would you say that that's fair? Yeah. Um, and on a side note, you were just doing Universal Chest Day, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. <laughs> so if you saw Jason at the gym, you can guarantee he was at the bench press uh, and not at the squat rack, which you've changed, you, you, which you have changed. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. In terms of the book, why did you ultimately write the book? And what are some of the core fundamental principles? Be and I'm going to preface this by saying you interview and uh, curate all of the health, not all, but a huge amount of information. It is your job to put good information out there, which means it's also your job to pick through the large scope of the buffet. How did you do it? And what are some of the points? So I, I think it, the, the why does stem from the passion for longevity to health span to joy span. And we felt like we are at this like great moment in time where there are so many great minds, there's so much great science, but it's still the, 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 the big objection to our world is still resources in terms of time and money. That's the objection. I don't have the time to do this. I work, I have kids, I have a life. I don't have three hours in the morning for morning sunlight and then sauna and then cold plunge. What? And then back. You don't? You don't have three hours? I mean, you only have two children. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the protocol for divorce if you're married. Uh, but, but there's still a lot of great science there. And so there's just so much great information, but the objection still looms large. And... In, a, in our mind, there was an opportunity, it was part, partly out of frustration, like we're in this business. This episode of the Dr. Gabrielle Lyons Show would not be possible if we did not have our amazing sponsors. And one of the sponsors of the show is Cozy Earth. I only partner with brands that I use and love and have personal experience with. And one of these brands, like I mentioned, is Cozy Earth. Cozy Earth makes the best sheets on the planet. And there's only two reasons to not get out of bed. Number one, you're exhausted. And number two, your bed feels like heaven. Cozy Earth delivers that. 
they have 100% premium, 100% viscous from bamboo sheets that feel like silk. Super soft, lightweight, temperature regulating. I'm telling you, these sheets are amazing year round. I absolutely love these sheets. They have a hundred night sleep guarantee, which means you have up to a hundred nights to sleep on it. You can wash it, try it out. And if you are not totally in love with these sheets, you can send them back for a full refund. They have whites along with natural colors. We are using oat in our house. So Cozy Earth's beddings, towels, clothing, all warranted against pilling, discoloration, and shredding. You can rest assured that they have it covered. Head on over to CozyEarth.com slash Dr. Lion and save 35%. We live and breathe it. This is our passion. We are married. Like We don't have the time for all of this. And so we just felt it was kind of somewhat incumbent upon us like how do we take all the all the great science all the great minds and put it into a book and present the information in a way that is grounded in research and science but provides takeaways that people who, who do work who have children who have lives can implement and not not put them in a position where they start reading something and they say like, all right, you lost me. I can't do that. I don't have to eliminate this food group or spend three hours on that, so forth. So it came and the book became the, we felt like the ultimate format to do that and also have a point of view and that you're, you can do in print, which is harder to do online. And I don't want to spoil it for anyone, but the first chapter is how did you decide on what you decided on? And if you want to talk a little bit about that, I think the first chapter, which I guess I will spoil it. I was going to say it was breath. Um, how did you decide on the the structure of the chapters and also specific techniques, people listening? We have a lot of people that are very busy and they want to know what do you do? Yeah. I mean, breath for us was kind of the easy place to start because you can have such a fundamental impact on both your anxiety levels, your stress levels, your sleep. It impacts so much. Your and, system. and it was one of those, we didn't even learn how to breathe properly until a couple of years ago. And again, we've been, you know, living and breathing this world for 15 years. You take 15 to 30,000 breaths a day. And I was definitely part of the 80% of the, you know, population that was breathing all wrong. And, and when you say breathing wrong, you mean breathing from uh, your... I was a mouth upper, breather. Oh, yeah. Mouth breather. Yeah. yeah that's... <laughs> oh, I know how that goes. Cats out of the bag. <laughs> um, but, you know, and it's like, how, how do you fix these things? And, you know, starting with just like the simple time in the carpool, when you're doing the dishes, starting to breathe through your nose. And then, um, you know, I think it actually, when you focus on it, can make you a better listener because you're not just jumping into the conversation, but you actually have to be a little bit more calm. And, you know, the ripple effects of this, and we talk about, um, this in, in the book, it's like when you have those wellness waves, when something starts going better in your life, you're just so inspired to like do the next thing and be more intentional about taking on something else. And the inverse, unfortunately, of that is also true. When you have a wellness pileup and things aren't going your way, you don't get sleep, then there's this cascading effect of maybe you miss a workout, maybe you're not cooking as well for yourself. So it's like when you get some of those easy wins, it makes the rest of it so easy. And I think breath is just such a great place to get an easy yeah, win. Yeah. And personally, I'm uh, you know, very, very fascinated by it, by my personal experience. And, and Colleen, you know, she shared her personal story. It's something you tend not to think about unless you can't breathe and not being able to breathe is one of the scariest things in the world. For sure. For sure. And it is, you know, you think about the power, you do it 15 to 1,000, 17, 15, 15 to 30,000 times a day. You don't think about it. And if you think about anxiety, it is the best real time tool you have. I'm a big fan of meditation. However, when you are anxious or if you're in a heated moment, it's very hard to say, I need a timeout. I'm gonna go meditate and find space or, or practice and practicing mindfulness. You can somewhat do that, but having that real time technique when you're in someone's face or someone's in your face and to be able to just like slow down your breath and try to be more consciously aware, whether it's your inhale for two, exhale for four, whether it's your box breathing. We love, one of the reasons why we moved to Miami, we love the school our kids go to. Our six-year-old learned box breathing. How is that possible? And she does it. She He's like, she draws the box. She draws the box. Well, explain, explain box breathing. For so the essentially it's, it's, it's inhale, 
hold, exhale, hold, inhale. I'm doing that's the yeah, yeah. And, and she for a count of four, right? Four In, four right. Four so it'd be four four the military four uses this. Exactly. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. You are the expert. This is your no, book. No. You are the breath expert. But but it's an amazing yeah. tool. And so I think just, and there's the downstream effects as Colleen, you know, it affects your anxiety, your stress response, your parasympathetic nervous system, your immune system. Like it just, w when you're breathing well, I think it puts you in a better state. And there's, there's such a profound impact on sleep, which is, you know, a chapter we're both so passionate about. 33% of Americans have some sort of sleep disorder. I think it's probably even more now. It's, it's, well, probably, <laughs> it's probably double. Yes. I, I didn't tell you this. So I'm, I track everything. I forgot to tell you. I didn't really, we, we woke up super early to fly here. Thank you so much. Of course, only for you. You're literally the only reason Colleen's come back to New York. Well, I'm thrilled. I'm taking her back with me to Houston. You know, we're going to Houston. We're going to go on this Yeah. We're, we'll see you later. <laughs> so I slept. We, I didn't sleep long, but I, sl I intentionally slept in my back last night. Part of the reason was that our six-year-old daughter climbed into our bed. The box breathing did not work for her at 2 a.m. Uh, and I slept in my back and, and, and was very conscious about breathing through my nose. And I track everything. And my respiratory rate actually was quite like the strongest it's ever been strong being like low not crazy low mm. so like yes i actually think that's why my deep and rem were better than they would be because i like they were normal deep and rem but i only got like six hours of sleep that's impressive because yeah. typically when people sleep on their back if if there's any issue with apnea it, it can but i don't have it i was like so in the zone with my mm -hmm. nasal breathing while you were sleeping that's impressive yeah whoa that's almost lucid dreaming material right there yeah when you think about um, the health and wellness, you think about breathing. Number one, it's free yeah. and everybody has to do it. Zero cost. Zero cost, free. Everybody has to do it. The components in the book are box breathing, which is a four count inhale, hold for four count, then exhale for four count. Yeah. And then, you know, you guys get the picture, the box. Yeah. And then the other part of that was, was there a well, I, double inhale? Well, I my personal favorite, which is in the book, is the, the inhale for two, exhale for four. I just think some people can sometimes it's get mine too. tripped up on the box. It's yeah. like, oh, now I have to think. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's way it, too much. It, it's know, real time useful. The inhale for two, exhale for four, I feel like is so simple and tried and true. And essentially, you just hold the exhale longer than the inhale. If you do the inverse of that, you have a problem. Yeah. And you mentioned something that I think is really important. You talked about how if someone is breathing incorrectly, they can increase their anxiety. Yes. Well, what if an individual doesn't realize that they have anxiety because they're not breathing well, yeah. right? It's not necessarily that they have an anxiety problem. Potentially, they could have a breathing problem, mm -hmm. which is feeding into this concept of being anxious and then... Bringing your fight or flight. Exactly. So if you are feeling anxious and you are listening to this, try it. Well, with all these tasks about the inhale, exhale, I mean, it can be all be very confusing, but the reality is everybody has to breathe. So you have to breathe. You might as well get it right. Yeah. Like well that. said. Yes. Well said. Yes. Well, next, what was the other, what, what are some of the other pillars, I mean, which I, by the way, already know what these pillars are, but I, you know, I don't want to steal the thunder of the book. So we're going to talk I mean, about breath dovetails to sleep. Sleep is like deeply personal for me. In my 20s, I couldn't fall asleep for three nights in a row, ended up at the hospital. Why? Too much caffeine? <laughs> um, you know, it was probably a combination of bad breathing. sleep etiquette, <laughs> the mouth breathing. It was exposed. a universal chest day, and yeah. then it was mouth breathing. It was just the whole thing. Exactly. The full moon, <laughs> if we want to go that direction, yeah. you know, wrong day in the astrology. Yeah. But I had I ha Mercury in retrograde. <laughs> totally, okay, totally. Okay, okay. We're, we're that that coupled with like real world anxiety over giving a presentation in front of 50 people and I couldn't fall asleep for like three nights. So I ended up in the hospital where they gave me a Xanax, which definitely helped put me to sleep. But then, you know, you're kind of right where you started because stress doesn't go away. It changes and evolves, you know, through life. And I didn't learn really how to sleep and think about sleep until much later in life. 
And for me, I'm super thoughtful about caffeine curfew. You know, when I came in here, it was a hot chocolate, not a Oh, really? Not I, a coffee. I picked up a hot chocolate off the floor? <laughs> I, I do not want to spill this coffee. I'm just going to want it. Yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't do the heavy stuff. I have to, you know, take a caffeine curfew and move it back a couple of hours. But, you know, really being thoughtful about sleep etiquette and things like th- – there are studies that show that if you have an alarm clock in your room and you are an anxious sleeper, that it actually can exacerbate those feelings of anxiety before you go to sleep because there's so much more anxiety involved – in the thought and the dread of not being able to fall and stay asleep than, you know, what the process actually entails. So sleep is something deeply personal for me. Like I can miss a week at the gym. I can, you know, eat crappy for a week and I'll be okay. If I don't sleep for a week, I will literally be in the hospital, (laughs) Um, a place, you know, I I really don't want to frequent. So it's been a journey for me. And, you know, it's something I'm always going to have to be thoughtful and intentional about. Um, But I also don't want it to control my life. And I still want to find joy in it. So even though every sleep expert will tell you not to watch TV in bed, we found that, you know, watching TV in bed brings us a lot of joy. I agree with you. (laughs) Now, the next question is, what are you watching? I'm going to share with you what we're watching. SEAL Team 6. Ooh, we'll yeah. have to add I that think it's. I think repertoire. actually it's just called SEAL Team. Uh, no, I think it's SEAL Team 6. But they, they're they on uh, deployment number 5,085. But it's just pretty I, impressive. I, I think you're hitting on a really important point that, you know, you can't watch, you know, anxiety ridden murder mysteries or things that are going to cause you, you know, bad news cycles before you go to bed. Like we've been loving learning about Formula One and, um, Ted you know, Lasso. Ted Lasso. Um, I learned so much about golf through the amazing Netflix golf series um, and lots of inspirational kind of sports stories through the Netflix tennis series. Like there's just there's some good quality TV and we find it important to really exit the wellness world so that it's not like, oh, we're working. It has to be outside of our world. We'll watch Bill Maher. (laughs) Okay. Okay. And then to your point about understanding people, people's our earlier discussion around understanding different points of view. Whenever we're like near an election or something big politically, I will con- we will consciously watch Fox and watch CNN and MSNBC and just rotate and just understand what everyone's saying. Deeply balanced. This is very. This is this is pretty impressive. I'm trying to yeah. understand, like the craziness of the world. Yeah. yeah, and we do that in the wellness world too. We will read and consume everything. I think and that, curate the best. <laughs> I mean that I that is pretty amazing. And also that you are instead of I love how you said exit the wellness world because it can be very dogmatic. Right. And basically the worst thing anyone could ever do on the face of the earth would be to watch TV in bed. You realize that you are destroying your circuit. How could you do that? And this is what is so funny is that in the real world, it does it have to be so binary. I mean, are you. You know, again, you said waking up, doing your meditation, you have three hours later. I don't know who has time to do that. And then the other aspect is, you know, you shouldn't be on your phone and don't be watching. I mean, I should probably change the SEAL team uh, with all the deployments that maybe not be so relaxing. And I look over my husband is dead asleep. But the balance here that you're talking about is how do you integrate wellness with joy in the real world? And you guys are at the forefront of putting out that information and you both are really fit we're, we're trying you've had again you've had a crowned influence those. i've and, been and, in training for this conversation and, and yeah you know we we are doing push-ups after this that that, that was the I deal didn't work out today so <laughs> i'm up for that but like one of my my funny anecdotes you mentioned like you know being dogmatic in this world and and that's a real thing and there is judgment and like i'll share this you you will remember that when colleen was first it was a very we write about this in the book getting pregnant was extraordinarily challenging it was a long road and we waited to like the absolute end to start telling people and so colleen was pregnant and, and this was the pregnancy that ended up being ellie and a friend of ours in the space we will not know him this is was like looks at colleen and it's like you look bloated i think you have SIBO. <laughs> that is hilarious <laughs> <laughs> Colleen's like, no, I don't have SIBO. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> well, I'm actually pregnant. What were some of the takeaways aside from the TV situation, which I'm sure I, I think I read in this book that you were you guys do use uh, dimming lights, blue blocker, and you're doing the whole thing. You're kind of integrating, right? To some degree. Like, like we're not dogmatic about it. Yeah. Like when we go to bed, we we try to do the blackout as well. Like we watch TV and we have a you know, flat screen TV. So the blackout really isn't a blackout until <laughs> right, it's right. really lights out. And we do do, you know, we do have an eight sleep mattress and I do wear technology. We, we love eight sleep. So like, 
so do we. So like the EMF, I'm like, that's another conversation. Wow. You're irradiating yourself while you're sleeping? It, 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 it's, look, I think without going down, it is, it's a rabbit hole. And, and I think we all think, so, at least we think there's something there that's interesting that does make sense, but it quickly goes to a space of conspiracy theory and 5G and Bill Gates and the world and they're tracking everything and the chips and the vac and it's just too much. I'm grateful to Inside Tracker for sponsoring this episode of the show. And if you haven't tried Inside Tracker yet, it is your time. They are slowly adding new biomarkers. And the most recent one that they added is ApoB. ApoB is the best biomarker for assessing heart health. This is very important above and beyond a basic cholesterol panel. ApoB is the most standardized and accurate predictor of heart disease risk. If you have a family member that has had heart disease, if you are concerned about it, one of the best ways to address heart disease early is to know your risk. Head on over to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon. You'll get 20% off any of the plans. I use them personally. I've had a great experience with them. Head on over to insidetracker.com and you will get a personalized plan. It will show you where you are, where you need to be, what your current age is, and what your biological age is. I'm happy to report that mine is younger than my actual age. And I'd like to attribute that to a healthy lifestyle. But in order to know if what you are doing is in fact working, then you do need to test. Again, there are a handful of different plans it's very easy. You'll get a notification when your results are ready. Head on over to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon, get 20% off. And it's really hard to speak to someone who we think is really credible and balanced. I don't think that exists. So at any rate, we, viol we violate that rule. Yeah, I think you have to be like dogmatic about the things that are actually going to move the needle for you. So like for me, that's like unfortunately changed like how I consume alcohol. I, ch I consume a lot less. <laughs> and if I do, I try to have it earlier in the day. Earlier in the day. So I'll be the, you know, weird person is that, ordering is that, a margarita was, at brunch. Yeah, was that why? No, exactly. Check out that backpack. <laughs> <laughs> what are the uh, recommendations that you give in the book for sleep? So temperature is a big one. So if you have, if you have if you can cool your room to 65, that's always a good one. Or if you have a, a if you have a cooling mattress, that's amazing. I think me alcohol is a huge one. Meal timing is another one. T tell, okay, so I want to hear about the meal timing. When should you stop eating for sleep? You know, I think everyone again, you need to feel feel what works right uh, for you. But I think our general rule of thumb is like three hours mm -hmm. and I try not to have too heavy of a meal. Sugar, like the heavy desserts, especially. And we just naturally eased into that from like a family rhythm standpoint because we have two kids who eat early. So it was just like, great, we'll just make this our meal time. Do the early bird special. Um, exactly. Routine. routine is very big with sleep. Try, try to establish a routine that relaxes you and go, go to that routine, especially for those who struggle because like you start setting yourself up for success <laughs> and you start building that momentum. And what I'm hearing you say is that I'm assuming that you don't have a huge variation in the time you wake up and the time you go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> Colleen doesn't. Jason. I, I, not really. Days. Yeah, I'm a little earlier these days. But is it consistent? I mean, I think, yeah, yeah, because we have a schedule with kids, like our life is, you know, relatively consistent because they're going to wake us up if we're not up. And, um, you know, because of the impact that a late night out will have, um, you know, we don't, do it. we don't do it. Yeah. We try to drink earlier at lunch. Um, or if we do have a drink, it's, you know, on the earlier side and it's not that so frequent like, because of yeah. its impact on our sleep. Yeah. Like if someone invites us to dinner at 8.30 PM, we're like, we just can't even fathom what that would. We wouldn't do well in Argentina. That That's, that's parent uh, midnight. <laughs> totally. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's parent midnight. You cover nutrition, you cover exercise, you also cover connection, which I thought was really unusual. Tell me why you chose that. You know, I think that's just, that's a huge one given, given where we are in this moment of time. You know, there was this great study in 2019 that came out, which essentially said that half of all people lacked any meaningful IRL connection. This was 2019. Can you just imagine mm. what that number is and that's in real life. Yeah. Yes, IRA, in real life. And so, you know, coming back to 
to joy span, we just think this is so paramount. And I'm gonna I'm gonna share one of my favorite studies, the Rosetto study. I love, love, love this study. And so even though I do all the things, nutrition, the exercise, the 28 vials of blood twice a year, the trackers, I do all the things. This study is a good reminder for me personally about connection. And so the Rosetto study, Rosetto was a small town, uh, rural town in, in Pennsylvania in the 1950s. And in the 50s, heart disease arrives in America, unfortunately. With the exception of Rosetto, there uh, population under 65, I think, had half the rate of heart disease, and heart disease was completely absent for under 55, which is like unbelievable. So they study Rosetta and they're like, what on earth are these people doing? That heart disease is just not here. They're immune to heart disease. And so they look at their diet and what are they having? Spaghetti and meatballs, and they're drinking every night and they're smoking. And so that's not it. And they took a closer look at the community. It was small, very close-knit Italian community, multi-generational living was paramount. They were celebrating every night, you know, whether it's an anniversary or a birthday, um, you know, the, the, the famous saying, it takes a village, like it really did. And those people stuck together and they were joyful. And you know what happened in the early 60s when the community started to break up, people started to go away to college and so on heart disease catches up with the national average. And if you ask any any reputable doctor in our space, will say all these things are wrong and they were wrong. But to me, it just speaks to the magic of connection. And there are other studies that, you know, there are so many studies we could cherry pick them, but I, I will for the purpose of, of <laughs> me proving this point. So, you know, essentially exercise can lower mortality anywhere between, you know, 20 and 40%, uh, nutrition, 30%. But having a loving, being in a loving relationship or uh, meaningful friendships can lower mortality up to 45%. And like there's study after study with happiness and joy. And it is just something I think we don't talk enough. And there are so many people, I think, in our space, in our world, we're consumed with nutrition, we're consumed with exercise. And like, look, that's important. But if you're miserable, you're going to die a premature death you will not maximize your, well, as we'll say, joy span. I love that. I actually, I had never thought about that before, frankly. When I think about health and wellness, I, I do. I think about nutrition and sleep, although I have two really little kids, so I don't really think about sleep that much, and exercise, all the things. But I don't, I, I, I think about community. But what you said that is really fascinating is happiness. I don't think I have ever thought about happiness, nor have I ever prescribed that, and I should. I think you're probably generally happy. I am a, I am a very happy person. Yeah, and like you have, you know, you're yes. married, you're happy, very, you have two beautiful kids. And a lot of people can't say that. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, it, it, it's just something not to lose sight of, and I do think we lost sight of that. And it's something I need to be reminded of. So like on a, on a personal note, you know, I, I I went to Columbia, I had a, I played basketball in a fraternity, all of the, you know, picture what that looked like, that was me. I had, and in my 20s, we had an amazing group of friends, 15 to 20 guys, we all lived in New York, all had a great time, and it was just like this an amazing community. And then, you know, people start to move away. It's like my Rosetto story, and uh, I, you know, get married, kids, business, and like, I lost touch. And, and I'm not alone. I'm still a very happy person, but I think of like friendship and community. It's something like, you know, in my 40s, and, and men are actually terrible here, I think, compared yeah. to women. It's like, oh, wow, like I've lost touch with a lot of people. And this is something I need to work on. And I, I don't think I'm unique. You're not. You're not. We see that with the military when they transition. When they transition from military to civilian, they lose the brotherhood. They lose their brothers. And it's not just men. It's men and women. And this is the time where depression, substance abuse, suicide, all of these things pick up. Yes. And what, men don't share. And men don't share. That is very true. The idea of happiness, how do you, I don't know, what do you, have you thought much about how to implement that? I mean, I guess it's different. I mean, I guess it's different for everybody. But you said something, and I, I don't mean to interrupt you, Colin. But you said something really interesting. You said, "Here I am," and we were talking before we turned this on, and we were uh, talking about Jason's muscles and all the other things. He was back there doing squats and, and and sprinting to the bathroom back and forth. You know, getting a pump for the show. 
<laughs> you you said something really interesting. You said I am, you know, I'm co-founder of Mind Body Green, but the most important thing in my life is my family. Yeah. And the happiness that comes from your family. Yeah, I mean, we we talk a lot about this idea of purpose, and we love how Arthur Brooks coins it in terms of writing a personal mission statement and really thinking about the type of life that you want, what brings you joy within that life, and how you are serving others, how you are caring for that others, how do you how you feel useful? And I went through so many stages of you know trying to find my purpose and putting a lot of effort behind it, and you know instead kind of had to step back and, and realize too that as the decades unfold, my purpose in life changes. And then I also, you know, went through this exercise of looking forward and thinking about, okay, what is the type of life that I want to have in my 70s and my 80s and my 90s? And you know, you imagine a world where you're hopefully potentially, if my children into that future grandchildren, you know, are nearby and I want to be present with them. I want to have the type of relationship with my children where they want their children to be part of my life. I want to be agile on the ground with them and able to move and play in a way that, you know, has a lot of ease. And so you start thinking about, you know, preparing and your body and your soul for the the type of life that you do want in, you know, 20, 30 years. And for me, that has taken on a lot of different roles um, kind of through through the ages. And, you know, one of the things that has brought me a lot of joy is is really being closer to water in a way. I feel like that brings me closer to nature, closer to the universe. And, and it's helped playing more of bringing more of the transcendent into my life here. But through it all, like right now, caring for our family is, you know, is my purpose. And And yes, I have this really other side job here on the side. Oh, yeah, that thing that has 15 million <laughs> views or downs or whatever it is a day or a month or something outrageous. But yeah, in terms of, you know, values, I, I have gotten so much personal purpose, you know, out of that. And I know through the decades, it's going to change. And, you know, right now, there's parts of my life that I'm not able to nurture with the same love. You know, we've all kind of joked about not having enough time. And there'll be a there'll be a decade in life where I have a lot of time. And I want to make sure, you know, that as I navigate through these these decades that I continue to ask myself and kind of check in on the present and then look to the future of where I'm going. And what is the one piece of advice that you would give an individual who's sitting at home thinking, I'm a complete workaholic, I want to be successful, I want to make money for my family, and I'm not happy? What would you tell them? I think it's a couple things. So look, people have to work, people have to make a living. Financial security is is a big thing and you know for anyone you know look we've had money worries along the way there have been stressful times and when you, I don't want to discount you know financial wellness that's a big thing when you're worried about your finances you're not sleeping well you're not exercising you're not eating well like it dovetails that's like super important that's something we actually don't talk enough in this space yeah but so like with all that said I think the questions I would ask, you know, are are you looking forward or are you looking backward? That's a big one. Are you reminiscing about the past? Are you regretting? Are you thinking about exes? Are you thinking about I should have done this or that? Or are the things you're looking forward to? You know, what's the new project? What's the that vacation? Although I will say, if you're thinking about vacation too much, that's probably you're probably in the wrong position that you're looking to escape. Um, so you're looking forward. You're looking backward in terms of connection. You know. Do you have someone you can call when, you know, things hit the fan? Things hit the fan. You're allowed to swear on this show. Exactly. We'll beep it out. <laughs> you can't. You need to ask yourself, like, why, why is that? Maybe it's time for some introspection. Maybe you need to reach out to some people. A great tip um, we got from Esther Perel, we include in the book. I think it's gone a long way. And this is something I've included. It, it's, you know, when I was growing up, you'd have to pick up the phone and call someone and say, hello. And they would say, who is this? And you'd say, oh, it's me. Remember me? <laughs> Versus today, you can just text and say, hey, so-and-so, it's Jason. You know, I thought of you and I just wanted to reach out, you know, how are you doing? Would love to catch up sometime. It's that simple. And you would be surprised by the response in that you will probably get a response to the positive. And if you don't, you're going to know. And no big deal. You move on. It's a text. It's not as confrontational as like, oh my God, a voice phone call. Uh, so like, so that's a big one. And I, I think like that that's kind of a good place to start. 
that introspection. I think another big one is, you know, what waking up in the morning, like what, what brings you joy? What do you want to do more of? What do you want to do less of? Taking inventory is something we do a, quite, regularly. quite regularly. How often do you guys make a new why statement? Why you're doing what you're doing? I think not that often anymore. I think the big one was when we had children. I think things changed in that pre-kids, it was, and look, we still work a lot. My Buddy Green is still our first child, but it was My Buddy Green above. That's a big child. Yeah. That child must eat a lot. Unwieldy, yes. <laughs> Very hard labor. <laughs> Gen Z, well, wow. Uh, and, and I think with children, it kind of put everything in perspective. And the why, you know, I think is our family, is our children. People will use the word like legacy and, you know, making the world a better place. And like, I, I, I think we do actually want to make the world a better place. And I, I do think all the uh, the anger, all the divisiveness, all the the all that all are all the wonderful and terrible things about our world also are part of our why right now. We think we see, serve a purpose with my body green and everything we do. So like it is it is purpose driven, but I think family entered the equation in a, in a new way and different way when we had our children. Yeah, and, and I mean, going back to your question about that stressed out person, I, I mean, I know that person who, you know, was working too hard, too many corporate jobs, you know, and, and too much stress. And um, I wish I could have been more more thoughtful and nurturing with her because I think we put too much pressure to connote purpose with job. And if you are lucky enough to have your vocation be your purpose, like fantastic. But that you know should not be the expectation. I do think it sets us up um, for failure. <laughs> and I, you know, whenever I talk to anyone who's like, should I quit my job and and do this entrepreneurial venture? I'm like, no, you should figure out if it works first, ease into it on the side and use the stability that you have from your current job and your financial well-being. Because if then you find yourself in a situation where this project doesn't pan out and you don't have a job and then you're worried about money and rent and caring for your basic needs, like that doesn't that doesn't help. So I think it's, you know, really about just putting one foot in front of the other. And if your your job isn't bringing you joy, trying to find out what does bring you joy. And if you can't answer that question, you know, then then really just putting one foot in front of the other until you can answer it. But but I'd add to your point, I think, and I we do we do still struggle with this. I'll speak for me personally is pre kids, you know, my identity, well it still is, is founder of my buddy green. And so Often, you mean it's not buff, uh, yeah. basketball oh, player? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Like, uh, she yeah. slipped me a five, and she was like, "Hey, gotta make sure to tell me." How do you want to join this gym? <laughs> uh, no, she was very supportive, but she was like, "You really need a trainer this often?" I'm like, "I knew do at the beginning." Uh, so you know, I, I do think you know your self esteem, the day you're having. You know, when traffic is good or revenue or this supplement or whatever it might be, or this interview, you'd feel good. And I think we'd feel more the ups and downs more because our, our identity would be so wrapped up in mind, body, green with kids that somewhat changed. And mm -hmm. like I'm dad first, um, although we still struggle with that. Like there, there are days when you, if you're an entrepreneur, there are always bad days, like nothing. And you're like, really? yeah, and, 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 and like, I'm totally getting and that's something we yeah. still work on, but I think yeah. more so pre kids. Yeah. Mm. That's really important. in just in terms of the spectrum of life, right. Of how in, in this world, do we balance family really moving the needle for people? Where do you think the space is going? Many years ago, you were on the forefront. You both were on the forefront of putting information in place, of doing the things that probably felt crazy to people. Like, what are they talking about? They're doing their mind, body, green. What is this? I am sure that you have thought about what is coming next. You're one of those things. <laughs> you are coming next. You are here. <laughs> and so, you know, we're huge believers in what you're doing, muscle-centric medicine. Thank like, you if know. you look at, like, look, there's so much gray in our space and nuance. However, when you we're talking about the connection between lean muscle mass, you know, we all know the stat. It's 
one out of four people fall over the age of 60, 65. If you fall once, you are twice as likely to fall again. If you fall and break a hip, you have a 30 to 40% chance of dying within a year. I want to point out to everyone who's listening, that doesn't mean you die from the broken hip. It's all the things that could have the compli- And look, you can die, like the complications, whether it's like an infection in the hospital or a bedridden. Thank you for clarifying I that. lose hope. Someone's going to try to cancel us. <laughs> thank you for clarifying. Unfortunately, and look, like, I know much of our world speaks anecdotally, so I try to avoid it. Like those, that's the those are the stats. But anecdotally, we've seen this play out, unfortunately, with like friends. Um, and so with all that said, like I think without question, when you look at the data, um, you need to focus on building lean muscle mass. Thank you to First Form for sponsoring this episode of the show. And one of the products that I love that they have is collagen with Dermaval. And I use the unflavored collagen. That way I can put it in my coffee. I can mix it in water. Collagen is a protein found in nearly every joint, tendon, bone, ligament. There's some data that is beginning to support the use for joint health, which is wonderful. Oftentimes when we think about collagen, we think about hair, skin, and nails, but really as it relates to joints, there is some increasing evidence with the utilization of collagen and vitamin C. This is low temperature processed hydrolyzed collagen powder. It is high quality and bioavailable. There are five different types of collagen within this collagen. It does have an amino acid profile that is diverse. You can use it in your shakes, uh, help your skin, hair and nails, even your joints. Head on over to firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. And even though I use the unflavored, they have peanut butter, chocolate, vanilla, salted caramel. Take your pick. Great product. I think that you will absolutely love it, especially if you are aging and you are concerned about your skin integrity and your joints. Head on over to firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. So for a variety of reasons. One, it's not just about the life you want to live. You want to be, be mobile. You want to be strong when you're in your 70s, 80s, and so on with your grandchildren or great-grandchildren. If you do have a moment where you slip, are you strong enough to potentially break the fall? Or do you have mobility so you can grab something? Or do you have the body armor to absorb the fall? So like that, that is so, and not even without going into like, this is your world, metabolic health and all the other things that can go wrong. And the best way to combat so much of this is building lean muscle mass. It's like, there's so there's hundreds of, it's not just about the fall. Right. It's, it's not, bigger it's, than that. It's, it's about so cardiovascular bigger. health and metabolic health and the downstream effects. And so without question, that is something that, we believe is here to stay. And I think somewhat absent from the health and wellness conversation, that was a little bit like it's always been in fitness, like muscle and fitness and body has always been around. But I think in the more, I would say holistic space was kind of absent. It was about yoga and Pilates and, and, and definitely leaned Plant yeah, and I, I think the nutrition modalities tend to move with the movement modalities. And in the 2010s, it was a lot of yoga. And I think and a lot of juice. vegan, vegetarianism, <laughs> lots of green juice kind of had that moment. That's when you had SIBO. It. Exactly. 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 And, you know, now it's it's really exciting to see women, you know, turning to the gym for weightlifting classes. Um, you know, there's been a huge surgence of that within class pass and people with um, data around like which classes women are choosing. So I think it these two moda- movement and nutrition tend to move in tandem. And it's really exciting to see this new wave that you are definitely at the forefront of. <laughs> You are, and it's indisputable. Like, you know, if you're looking to build muscle and you talk about muscle protein synthesis, all the things mm-hmm. your audience is familiar with, yeah. and I'm not going to go through all the numbers because you are the queen, the, that you are the queen. Uh, it, it's just, it, it, there's no denying it. And so that, that is, is so big. Um, you know, and I'll bring it back to like connection and joy. We just think have sort of been absent from the conversation and are just so critical, especially in this moment of time, we're in a loneliness epidemic. There's the other great, you know, not great, terrible statistic. Loneliness is equal to the smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Um, You know, we've got, it's not just loneliness, we've got a mental health epidemic. And, you know, we've got some work to do. And, you know, you can be, again, you can be the fittest, 
You can be doing all the things, but be miserable and a complete emotional wreck. Mm. And that's just something that we, we really think is, is needs to, uh, we hope it's here to stay, uh, just needs to really enter the conversation. I actually, I really have never thought about that before. I have like, never thought about well, happiness. Think, think about it this way too. So I'd say most people kind of know if they're not eating well. Most people know if they're probably not, you know, not working. Come on, you guys all know it. <laughs> you know, kind of. but I would say when it comes to emotional well-being, I think a lot of people are like, huh, you know, I never really think about that. Like, did I do the front inventory? Do I really, do I really have purpose? Am I really, you know, happiness I think is tricky, but, but I think that is a little bit more nuanced and not top of mind. And are you making the right effort? I mean, we talked a little bit about the show. Like, I think for 13 years of my life, I wasn't making enough of an effort to connect to old friends, to make new friends in a new community. I think when you start thinking about connection and how important it is, like, you really have to be aggressive about making connections, making friends, doing things that make you uncomfortable, being the first one to ask someone else out on a friend date and to keep in touch, um, you know, in some cases, putting yourself in like slightly vulnerable situations. So I've had to, to really work on that myself, kind of seeing that I'm now in a new area that I know I'll be in for at least 15 years, probably more. And that I do, you know, see the importance of, of having a group, um, of supportive women, not just from college, but, you know, really near and dear to me. Yeah. I want to highlight something that you said, you said something about doing something uncomfortable and you also said happiness in in the same sentence. Well, like potentially in the same in the, potentially in the same sentence. I often think about happiness as doesn't matter if I'm happy. But what I realize is that it doesn't matter if I'm executing and doing an action, happiness in that moment for an outcome that is going to generate joy. And that I think is so important. And that's what you're talking about. You, you know, we're using kind of happiness and joy interchangeably, but the initial thing of doing hard things, people are going to be like, that is not making me happy. And you're right. And I would say a whole bunch of swear words now, but I'm not because I'm hoping that there will be, your kids will listen to this, is that you do the, the hard thing in the moment and that hard thing in the moment may not make you happy. You, you might be quite miserable. But subsequently, you begin to facilitate joy and happiness because what does that end up meaning? That you have new friends or you, I don't know, ran 100 miles or whatever it is that you're doing. Or if you're like Jason squatting 575 pounds. And that's really critical. (laughs) There's a solution to that. And yeah, joy, happiness. Uh, Again, I have always thought that happiness is irrelevant but it's not because the joy after doing the hard thing or whatever it is, is, is critical. Yeah. And I think after, you know, it's, you get that wellness wave, whether it's, you know, making a friend or I don't think anyone, not most necessarily love that first day in the gym, the first time they're eating healthy, but it's like, once you get that momentum, you're like, Oh, okay, I get this. I want to do it more. And you start seeing those, um, you know, whether it's joy or whether it's just signs of momentum. And then it's like, oh, this is just an actually joyful way to live. <laughs> I love that. I love that. There is one thing that I wanted to talk about, but I, I know we're getting tight on time unless you guys kind of have a, a little bit of time. Um, and I don't know a better way of saying it, but you called it um, Kardashian wellness. What is that? Do you want to start this one? I mean, that was just, yeah. that was hilarious. Yeah. I mean, I think when I- and we, We'll watch that show. Yeah, I actually love the show. I love the show. And and we use it really as a as a metaphor for for some of the things that happen in some of the predominantly coastal but not just limited to coastal wellness that you know kind of make me cringe when we talk about The knock on wellness and why we have a complicated relationship with the world is because you think it's very expensive. It's out of touch. It's not something that people can incorporate into their lives. Um, And I saw that a lot when we lived in New York for, for 14 years. And, you know, I didn't feel like it was a movement that I felt included in or wanted to be a part of when well-being to me is so much more about just the fundamentals of kind of these life skills that we've been talking about through our conversation and and less about these wellness things or aesthetics or quote unquote vibes. And 
um, you know, it's why we intentionally moved away. And our book is not the joy of wellness. It's, it's the joy of well-being to try to bring it back to this conversation on the fundamentals. I, I think what you're also getting at is a feeling that that type of wellness was a bit more of a popularity contest, uh, but the, the, the kind that felt like more like a high school popularity contest, um, you know, maybe the, it, it was a little bit more flashier, maybe lacking substance. And, you know, I think, again, the big objection to, to health is time and resources. And we've come so far and technology has advanced, there are so many great products, but it plays into that stereotype in a way that, you know, is kind of hilarious um, and not inclusive. And look, if you have the resources, there are a lot of great, you know, it's like eight sleep, that's not cheap, right. mm -hmm. but it's amazing. And if you can afford that and sleep's important to you, knock yourself out. And I think like that card, you know, it, it, it feels almost like cult of personality and like a pop culture way, which, you know, look, there's good to it, but, you know, I think what we're attracted to is substance mm. and science and another big one that people don't have, nuance and balance. I would say that's a four letter word, but it's more than four letters. <laughs> It's more than four letters. I, I think it's great. I think you guys are doing amazing work. I'm so happy that you got up early and you missed your beauty sleep to come and hang out with me. This episode is going to be so valuable for people. And your book is great. The Joy of Well-Being, not The Joy of Wellness. And obviously, I'm going to include where everybody can find you. You guys are changing the game. You're a little short. You're a little short, but you are changing the game. And I'm so grateful for your time and energy. So thank you. Well, you are so kind. It's such an honor to to be here. And you're literally the only people we fly to New York for. So <laughs> thank you for inspiring us. Yes. Aw, thank you. Mm -hmm.